And uh, the first week, at the beginning of the year, it's customary in religious science to uh, talk about the first four pre-chapters of the Science of Mind textbook. And uh, the first chapter is um, The Thing Itself, which I spoke about uh, a couple weeks ago. And the thing of self, itself, of course, is spirit, God. Uh, last week, Reverend Franklin spoke about the way it works, the way spirit works. And this week, uh, the chapter is what it does. And next week, Reverend Lind will speak on how to use it. And so this week, what it does. And the essence of what it does is what it does for us, it must do through us. It's kind of different than our upbringing of uh, religion, of something out there coming down and intervening in our lives and doing it for us. What God does for us, God must do through us. And just a recap of the first week also, I ask you, what would it be like in this new year, 2018, if you were fully awake and present to the life that you have now, fully awake and present to who you are in every moment, fully awake and present to what brings you joy here and now, and fully awake and present to the life that you are creating right here, right now, with every thought you think, with every feeling you feel, and with every word that you speak. And today I'd like to add another question to that. And that question is very relevant to me this week. What would 2018 be like if your heart was fully awake and present to, present to grace? As Denny sung about the grace of God. There was a five-year-old that said grace at his family's supper table one night. And uh, he said, thank you, God, for these pancakes. And his parents said, why did you say thank you, God, for these pancakes? We're eating spaghetti tonight, not pancakes. And he smiled at him and said, I just thought I'd see if he's paying attention. <laughs> so... Of course, we're not talking about that kind of grace, but God is always paying attention. And God's grace is always and in all ways present and available to us all the time. And you might ask, well, what is grace? I was once told that living by grace being means being secure and supported by the metaphysical arms of God, immersed in and surrounded by the love of God. And I think that's a pretty good way of putting it, actually. In, the science, in our Science of Mind chapter that we're talking about this week, what it does, Ernest Holmes writes, here and now we are surrounded by and immersed in an infinite good. How much of this infinite good is ours? All of it. Say after me. Here and now I am surrounded by. Here and now I am surrounded by. And immersed in an infinite good. And immersed in an infinite good. Here and now I live in God's grace. Here and I know in a lot of our past uh, religious upbringing, we've been told that we don't ex exactly deserve this grace, right? That it was, that it's unmerited, that we have to earn it. Why? Probably because we're sinners. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> we know that that's not true, don't we, in our teaching? We know that we do deserve all of God's 
good that we can embody because God's grace is now and forever freely given. It does not have to be deserved, merited, or earned. Ernest Holmes says that the grace, that grace is the givingness of life, and that certainly it is given automatically. And he says that grace is the givingness of spirit to its creation. And, and for all the Bible readers, I know we have a few, and I know we have many that have read the Bible, but in Psalms it reads this beautiful verse, grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever. And we can tell that the Bible messages that we received growing up have been massaged quite a lot to make us be good little boys and girls and earn our grace. Because even the Apostle Paul, if you read the verse, said, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of any works. It's freely given to all. It's available in every second. Dr. Holmes writes in The Science of Mind, God loves all alike and causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine alike upon all. In arms which are inclusive, divine love encompasses everything. But here's the thing. The thing is, we must receive it. We must accept it. We must open our hearts and our minds and our very law lives for God's grace to have its way with us. We have to be receptive. We have to be open. We have to be available. Because you know, we all in our individuality want to uh, do everything ourselves. We want to show how powerful we are. We want to not depend on anything else. We want to be self-sufficient. And we separate ourselves in consciousness from God's grace. And I know a lot of you have heard my story of my, uh, um, my dissipated youth. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that have haven't, I will tell you. And this is, this is a moment where I truly experienced God's grace. And it has stuck with me. Uh, I had been an, a bar musician, an alcoholic, drug addict for many years. And as the years passed on, it got worse and worse and worse until, until most of the time I was miserable. And uh, I thought, well, I can do this myself. And so once I stopped for a week, once I stopped for even two months, and many times I would stop for 45 minutes, I'd come to the bar and say, I'm not drinking tonight. After the first set, I was at the bar. Until one night, after many bad years, I ended up in a park in the morning in Denver with my, uh, my uh, party partner. <laughs> and uh, I passed out after doing some drugs. And I went into a out-of-body experience. I may have not have told this in completion, but I went into an out-of-body experience 
it was absolute technicolor of raising up above this park. I was raising up against the, above this park. And there were people down in this park playing softball. And one of them said to the other, who's up at bat next? And the other guy goes, Woody. Of course, that's what they all called me, you know. And the other guy said, no, Woody can't bat. He's dead. And right after that moment, my partner had cleared my throat of my own vomit because my face had turned purple to where I could breathe and I came back. We went back to his house. He immediately fell asleep. And I had a moment of total surrender and reckoning where I lost all self-will and was ready to accept the grace of God. And I called my sister. She took me to a hospital. I wanted to detox in a hospital for three days. And uh, anyway, the hospital wouldn't do that, but they did have a treatment program. And that was 35 years ago. So that has stuck with me. And it has a lot to do with what I'm talking about today. Because grace, well, I just read that, didn't I? Here's a great quote by the author, Philip Yancey. It goes along with this. Grace is a free gift, but to receive the gift, you have to have your hands open. And a lot of people don't have their hands open. It's simple. This whole teaching is simple when it comes down to it. In the original 1926 uh, edition of Ernest Holmes' Science of Mind, the original, he writes that grace is not something that God imposed upon us, but it's the logical result of the correct acceptance of life and a correct relationship to spirit. And I love these words by Ramakrishna. He was an Indian mystic and yogi in the 19th century. And he says the same thing, but more poetically. He says, the winds of grace are blowing all the time. All we have to do is raise our sails. See how we correspond to God. When we reach to God, God reaches back to us. We have to make the first move. There's a wonderful story from the Hindu faith that illustrates how we limit or restrict God's grace all the time. A great devotee of Krishna was once challenged by some powerful men in his village who didn't believe in Krishna, and they said to him, prove to us that your Krishna is a god. And they looked around and they saw one of their most sacred animals dead in the road. And they said to the devotee, they said, through the power of your Krishna, make this dead cow come back to life. And the devotee replied, this is no problem for Krishna, but give me three days. And so he spent the next three days in agonizing prayer, day in, day out, night and day, praying to Krishna to bring this cow back to life. And as each hour passed and the cow did not come back to life, well, he got more and more nervous. And finally, at the 11th hour, the cow came back to life and all the villagers rejoiced and believed that Krishna really is a god and the devotee, of course, was grateful and relieved. But a short time later, he became depressed and sad. And Krishna came to him and said, why are you so sad? And the devotee said, Lord, 
Why did you make me work so hard and get so desperate when you could have brought that cow back to life immediately? And Krishna says to him, son, it is you who gave me three days time. See how we get in the way? Once again, Ernest Holmes. The only reason we are limited is that we have not allowed the divine within us to more completely express. How much life can we experience? As much as we can embody. We grow in grace as it were. We grow in power. But right today, we can expect to demonstrate or to have our prayers answered according to our belief and the embodiment of that belief. When people ask me, what do you believe in religious science? I always, this is my religious science in a nutshell. It is done unto you as you believe. It's nothing new, just old wisdom. We call it new thought. And we have to open our minds and our hearts to receive it so that God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And it's the nature of the universe, as Holmes says, is it's the nature of the universe to give us what we are able to take or what we're able to receive. This infinite good or grace wishes to express through us as it passes into our being it automatically becomes the law of our lives. Therefore, Holmes says that we should have faith in it and in its desires and its ability to do for us all that we shall ever need to have done. And since it must pass through our consciousness to operate for us, we must be conscious that it is doing so. That's why Ernest Holmes created his form of affirmative prayer called spiritual mind treatment. He says that a treatment is a statement in the law embodying the concrete idea of our desires and accompanied by an unqualified faith that the law works for us as we work with it. So we must train our thought to work this way so that we can increase our good. All things are possible that we can conceive of and believe in. Love or spirit rules through law, the mechanical part of spirit. There's not separate parts, there's just God. But spirit conceives and the law receives and must create. And any law must first pass through our consciousness before we can make use of it. So it follows, Holmes says, that with all of our getting, we must get understanding. And that's why we teach the science of mind. That's why we teach spiritual mind treatment. That's why we have a community. That's why we have classes, so that we can all learn how these work intellectually, so that we can embody that into our hearts and minds and our spirit so that we are one with it as we are one with the one. In the book of Awakening written by Mark Nepo, he writes, each person is born with an unen unencumbered spot, free of expectation and regret, free of ambition and embarrassment, free of fear and worry, an umbilical spot of grace where we were each first touched by God. To know who we are, not by surface markers of identity, but by feeling our place in relation to the infinite and by inhabiting it. God's grace is like a vast ocean. We can sit on the shore and collect shells. We can go further still and catch a fish or we can dive deep and bring back a pearl. The deeper we dive, the more we align with the divine presence and the more that we are in the flow of grace. 